Okay. Our scripture today uh, comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 and 16 through 18. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all of those who have longed for his appearing. And to verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks to God. Again, good morning. It's a blessing to be here with you today. Two painters were asked to paint a picture illustrating peace. <coughs> illustrating peace. The first painter painted a beautiful evening scene in the foreground of a lake. The surface was absolutely still and calm, unruffled. Trees surrounded it. A meadow stretched out in the distance and there were some cattle out there gently browsing in a little cottage and the sun was setting and it all spoke of a place of rest. The second artist, he drew a wild stormy scene. Heavy black clouds hung overhead. In the center of the picture was an immense waterfall that poured forth huge volumes of water that sprayed up into foam. You could almost hear the unceasing roar of the water. Yet, there in the center of the painting, you could see a small bird perched in the cleft of a huge rock. The bird was sheltered from all danger. And the bird was pouring forth its sweet notes of joy. It is the second painter who could describe the peace that passes all understanding that comes from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God in the heart of the redeemed. You see, one can only have peace with himself or herself if you have peace with God. Today we are looking at the final words of Paul, the last apostle, to his protege Timothy. In there we're going to be able to see that Paul is indeed at peace with himself, and he is, in it, he is at peace with God. He has served his Lord and Savior to the best of his ability, and he is now making the final preparations before going to meet him in person. In our society, when someone is facing with death, when it's imminent, they tend to reflect, or we tend to reflect, on our death and on the immediate circumstances around us. We tend to look back on our life and review, and then we think about the future, a future that we will not be a part of. We begin to think about it speak of who and what the most important things to us are. We hope for a better life for our loved ones. And if we're Christian, we're certainly inevitably going to spend some of that time speaking with God. In preparation for death, many of us will make out our last will and testaments. And some commentators have said that the entire second letter to Tim Timothy is Paul's last will and testament. In the opening of today's text, Paul knows his death is imminent, and he's not swallowing in self-pity. Instead, he's just making a very factual statement. The time of my departure is near. 
He described his life as a liquid sacrifice, a libation poured out as an offering. I know libation is not a word we use a lot in, in English. The, the term would normally mean the offering of a liquid sacrifice, something like a bottle of wine. But in this case, Paul is referring to his life, to his blood that's about to be poured. The New Jerusalem Bible uh, translates that verse as my life is already being poured away as a libation. In reading this text and some of the other letters of Paul, we know that he looks back on his life as victorious. He says that he's fought hard and he's run the race. He's kept the faith. He longs to depart this world and to be with Christ Jesus. So in his final hours, Paul reflects on his life, on his many travels, and he prepares to leave final instructions to Timothy, his protege. Timothy will have to carry on the work. Let me ask you this. What would you do? What would you do if you knew that tomorrow was going to be your last day on earth? I've thought about that before. I've often heard people talk about it in conversation. What would you do if you knew it was your last day? There was a popular movie released back in like 2007. It had uh, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. It was called The Bucket List. Has anyone seen The Bucket List? Aside from some language, it's a really good movie. Okay? And the, it, popularized, it popularized the idea of making up our own bucket lists. That is a list of things that we want to do before we die. And at this time, people began posting their bucket lists on social media. I read some of them. People would say they wanted to do things like travel, learn a new language, lose weight, run a marathon, climb a mountain, drive a race car, fly in a hot air balloon. Some of them even said they'd like to go skydiving. Well, if I had a bucket list, a few of those things would be on it. Probably not mountain climbing and, and riding in a hot air balloon. And you could be most assured that skydiving would never, ever, under any circumstances, make the list. But if you knew your time frame was even much shorter than that, your list might include making a will. It might include contacting old friends, letting people know you love and care about them. It might include settling an old bitter dispute. And hopefully it would include spending some quality time with the Lord. I wanna share with you a story from a lady, her name is Kristen Armstrong. You may know the name, she was married to the famous or now infamous um, seven-time Tour de France bicycle race winner Lance Armstrong. They were about to get a divorce and she was shattered. She didn't know how she was going to explain the concept of a divorce to her three small young children. She broke down. She became very depressed. But with the help of her Christian friends and some support groups at the church, she got through the struggle. And when she came out on the other side, she wrote a book called Happily Ever After to help women recover from the trauma of divorce. In one entry in the book, this is what Kristen wrote. She said, If I knew tomorrow was the last day of my life, I would get up early. I would make coffee and have my prayer time before the kids woke up. I would praise God for all the days he gave me. 
I would snuggle my children and make pancakes for breakfast in the midst of the noise and chaos in my kitchen. I would pack lunches, braid hair, find shoes, brush teeth, and hand out backpacks. She said, I'd probably drive to school in my pajamas. I'd, play a, I'd pray a blessing over my children in the car. And after I was alone, I'd go running. I'd feel my lungs and my legs burn and notice the way that the sunlight filters through the trees along the town lake. I would try to meet up with a girlfriend for coffee. I would call my parents and my brother to say, hi, how are you? I love you. In other words, on my final day, I would do the exact same things that I do every day. I would live the life that I am living right now. If I had to choose, I'd choose what I have. First time I ever read that, I was crying like a baby. So, this is about the third time now I've shared that passage. And as I, at the time I first read it, was thinking about actually making my own bucket list, I was humbled and I was stunned as I read how she would spend her last day. It got me to think about things in a different perspective. It gave me ideas of what a bucket list might should really look like. Now let's go back and take a closer look at Paul's situation. The year is AD 64. A great fire broke out in Rome. The fire burned for six days and seven nights. Several people accused Nero of setting the fire and to deflect criticism, Nero, the sixth emperor of Rome, blamed the fire on Christians. He had a few members of the sect arrested and under torture, they accused others until the entire Christian population was implicated and they became fair game for retribution. Christians were rounded up and put to death in the most horrific ways for the amusement of the Roman citizens. Some were covered with hides of wild beasts and attacked by dogs. Some were nailed to crosses. Some were set fire in the evening to serve as lighting. Paul was chained up in a prison, probably suffering from inhumane conditions. The year is now AD 66 or 67. He's waiting to be executed in the New York. This is the city that Paul writes the second letter to Timothy. This is the world that he lived in as he's giving final instructions to his protege. You know, the last words that we share with someone often reveal what our inner character is like. And that's how it is with this final message from the pen of our beloved apostle. As we listen carefully to catch his message, as it were, from his dying lips, we're not guessed, you know, we're not left to guess faintly of what he might be talking about or what he means. There is a telling ring in his voice. His mind is clear, his words are emphatic, and he speaks volumes of truth. He speaks of perfect recognition, saying, I am ready to be offered. He speaks of assured success. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. He speaks of joyful hope. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown. In view of his crowning day, Paul could joyfully sing, O oh, death, where is thy sting? Paul also writes to Timothy of painful experiences. He was grieved that several close followers had forsaken him. 
In his words, having loved this present world. Paul wrote a forgiving love, much like Jesus after his arrest. And he wrote, only Luke is with me now. Listen as Paul shares his bucket list with us. He wrote a forgiving love. He said, I pray God to God that it may not be laid to their charge for deserting him. He is true to the spirit of his master in praying for those who despitefully used him and persecuted him. This ought to be the desire of all of us who have experienced the forgiving grace of God to overcome evil actions of others with our own good actions is what Paul calls fighting with the armor of God. Paul wrote of divine faithfulness. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And in his last testimony like that of Joshua, he speaks of the unfailing faithfulness of his God and Savior who said, Lo, I am with you always. So Paul did right with extreme confidence. The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. He is assured that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to come. The glory that will come when he shall appear. Look up to the day for your redemption draweth near. Paul has done all he can for the faithful. He is making preparations for the continuance of his call to spread the good news to the Gentiles through Timothy and through some of the other church leaders that he's writing to. Again, he wrote, For I am being poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You know, I pray those are words that we can all say in our final moments, in our final hours. Paul, knowing that he will soon be in the heavenly kingdom, gives all glory to God and prays for the Lord to be with his successor. He prays for Timothy to receive the grace and protection from the Lord. Because it is time. Others must carry on the work. You know, Paul was undoubtedly the greatest evangelist this world has ever known. He spent his final hours strengthening the work of his mission. The work that he had been called to. So as we look at his situation and the things that he was going through, yet all, the question always comes forth, how do we apply this today? How can we use this today? And my friends, the Lord has given everyone in this room differing gifts and talents. He's called upon us to develop those talents and to use them in the service and in the ministries that we've all individually been called to support. Paul's second letter was written to encourage Timothy. But the message applies to us today. Paul encourages us to make plans and to be sure that the ministries that we work for will continue to survive, continue to be supported after we are gone. I think, in other words, in Ruby Talk, he's telling us to complete our bucket lists while we still can. I'd like to close with a prayer that was written. I'm going to mess her name up, but I'm going to try. Her name is Safiya Fasua. She's a professor at Wesley Seminary. She wrote a poem called Living Libation. Make my life a libation poured out like oil, diffused through the air like perfume, blessing multitude. Make me a libation poured out to God, not to Mother Church or someone else's agendas. An emissary of Christ, lighthouse and cattle prod, good news and conscience code, bringing tidings of peace and warnings of wrath to come. 
Let me not be sacrificed on the altar of the church's indifference, nor let me confuse sacrifice with suffering for selfish gain. At the end of my days, when life on this globe is over, let it be truthfully said that my life was poured out for you. To which I can simply say, Amen and Amen.